Hi, welcome to Naptime Nutrition. I'm Yaka Lvova, registered dietitian nutritionist with Baby Bloom Nutrition. And here with me today is the fabulous Amy Woodward Fields, registered nurse, IBCLC. And today we're going to be talking about pumping. And all of you pumping mamas out there, you totally badass. You get my respect. Um, it's really hard. And we're going to talk about some tips and tricks on how to make it easier. So welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I love watching your nap time Tuesdays. <laughs> and um, I just think that's such a great resource. Are your kids really asleep right now? Do you do uh, the baby is, The baby's theoretically asleep. I've heard I've heard him talking to himself a little and the twins are at kindergarten. So oh. that's hopefully the baby's actually asleep. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. He, he's well, been known to make so a surprise much. appearance, though. <laughs> That always, I know sometimes he does. So that always works. Yeah. I'm here in Goodyear at the Wellness Center. And this is a yoga studio. And they also have a side that's for therapies for kids three and up, occupational therapy, physical therapy. And I have a an office here. We call this particular room the Mama Tribe Headquarters. And um, so I do home visits for lactation, but I also can see moms and babies here. And one of the things that I offer here in my office is a consult or an appointment just for pumping and back to work, because it can, there can be a lot of questions revolving around that. And, um, and like you said, to all the moms, especially those that are exclusively pumping, that is such a huge commitment. And I just give them so much credit for that, for sure. It's um, really hard. It is really hard because, I mean, you know, it, it can take time away from actually just cuddling and holding your baby. And mm -hmm. if, especially if you're exclusively pumping or if you have some milk supply issues and you're trying to increase your supply. And so it, it is a lot of work. I, I have three kids. I breastfed all three of them at working as a labor and delivery nurse. So I had 12 hour shifts and um, it was hard, like getting to take those pump breaks because I never knew if I was going to have a mom that I had to bring back to the OR for a cesarean birth, or if I was going to be, you know, in the middle of pushing and that mom had to push for a couple of hours and the whole time I'm like, Oh, I need to, pump. my breasts are so full. So, um, and you know, a lot of the moms that I work with that are teachers that have to try to figure out their breaks, like sometimes just being able to figure that out can be challenging, but you know, for, right. Yeah. For the first 18 years, um, what I did was worked as a labor and delivery nurse, and now I'm a board certified lactation consultant. So I don't work in the hospital at all anymore. And, um, so I was really there when moms were getting breastfeeding started in those first few days. So I always, when I teach a breastfeeding class or when I'm talking to new parents or expecting parents, I always say, you know, you may not ha ever have to pump at all. Like there are some women that don't have to pump. Maybe they're not going back to work outside of the home or something like that. So I always throw that out there because now it, I think it's amazing that insurance is providing pumps to um, new moms, which is great. So I always want to just throw that information out there that, um, you know, you, you may not have to pump at all, or, you know, you may not have to pump for several weeks or several months, depending on what the situation is. Yeah. So, and I yeah. think that's a really important point. When, when I first had my twins, I came home and I was planning to stay home with them. I had given up my job entirely. And, um, and for some reason I was pumping and I cannot for the life of me, remember why I was pumping and looking back on it, why did I add that stress? And so when someone comes to me with a pumping question, my first thing is to, to figure out if they actually need to be pumping or not, or if they're under some misguided perception the way that I was. You know, the hospital sent me home with this pump and I figured that's what I was supposed to do and I was so exhausted and honestly, I was very depressed and I just, I didn't think. We were we were supplementing with formula as well because well there were two of them and mm -hmm. sometimes that's necessary too and and I was still trying to pump and um and at some point I had to pump because I had a nipple wound and I needed to keep up my my supply and the pump was more gentle than a hungry mouth 
And that's a good reason to pump as well. But it's also important to know what your situation is and what your goals are. And if you don't have to pump right away and you can pump, you can start pumping later when you're when you're more established, when you have more of a routine down. Mm-hmm. Just think about what your goals are and think about if it's something you need to be doing. And so now we're going to go on the assumption that you do need to be doing it because plenty of women do um, going back to work or if you want um, you want some relief and you want your partner to be able to feed the baby or you need to get out for the day, you absolutely need some self-care and like go, go get a massage. Yeah. Definitely pump. You know, we are we are advocates of self-care here. But that's always the first question. Do you need to be doing this? Do you need to put the strain on yourself? Yes. And, you know, starting from day one, when we have a brand new baby, um, you know, if the because there are reasons, like you said, that a baby may need to be supplemented, maybe baby isn't latching well at all. Maybe baby's in the NICU because they're having a hard time breathing. Maybe baby has low blood sugar and baby needs to be supplemented with a little something or you have babies. (laughs) And so you have two babies, three babies. And um, so it can really start, you know, as early as, as day one. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I always try to teach new parents is hand expression. I think that's a huge um, skill that's so beneficial because what if you're out and about and you don't have your pump with you? And so, yeah, I I have this um, handout that I just found online that shows how to do hand expression What I really liked about that handout is it has a link at the very bottom for um, if you Google Stanford hand expression breastfeeding, it'll take you to the Stanford website for that hospital. And there's some really great hand expression videos there that I send links to to new moms all the time. I have this little handout that I'll show to new parents and it even has a little spoon on it to just show that in those first few days. you're only going to get about a teaspoon or so of colostrum. And so there's kind of the same picture as what we have up there. And so I always show new moms how to do hand expression. Maybe when the milk comes in and she's engorged and needs to soften up that breast a little bit, what if the electricity goes out and you can't pump if you have a pump that needs to be plugged in? Mm -hmm. So hand expression is definitely really important. And then, um, The other thing, I guess we could jump to the one with the supplemental nursing system with the baby actually breastfeeding at the breast and being supplemented at the same time. Because, um, you know, really, if you think about the most important things are to feed the baby and Mm -hmm. protect your supply. Because if breastfeeding at the breast is your goal, we can always come back around to that later as long as we have a baby that's healthy and growing and then, and a a good milk supply or working on a full milk supply. Totally agree. Yeah. So this is a homemade supplemental nursing system. Medela makes a couple different versions. I always bring those five French feeding tubes that I order from a medical supply service and then syringes so that baby can, like I said, be supplemented at the breast, which is nice because you had two babies that you were trying to bond with and take care of and feed and you were doing probably I mean usually we call it triple feeding but it was more than that because triple feeding would be um, feeding the baby at the breast pumping and then bottle feeding and so you were doing that with two babies that is a lot of work and I, I remember at some point I had a wound I think on my left so I would make what I was calling appetizer bottles where I would I would pump from one breast and I would give that and then nurse both of them on the other breast. And it was, it was unbelievable what was going on. Oh my gosh. But thank God I had a lot of support. It wasn't just me at home. I had a nanny and that's not something that, um, it's not something that I would have suggested to someone who's at home by herself with twins. That's not, um, Mm -hmm. it's not something that's sustainable. And we need to remember that whatever plan we come up with, it needs to be sustainable because we're already Mm -hmm. getting lack of sleep. We're already burning an immense amount of calories with production of breast milk. And then then just feeding yourself is such a challenge. So doing these crazy complicated, you know, like circus breastfeeding, (laughs) sometimes we have to be easier on on ourselves. (laughs) Yes, and really whatever care plan you have should be should be changed 
every day or two. Mm -hmm. So if you go home from the hospital and they've given you that care plan of, you know, breastfeeding, pumping, bottle feeding, like you want to check back in with someone. So that's important for noms to know because that it's not sustainable at right. all. And so there has to be some give. So sometimes for some moms, it is introducing the supplemental nursing system so they can get rid of the bottle part of it, but it also helps because the baby is doing some of the stimulation. So then um, usually moms don't have to pump quite as often. So you and have then, a situation there where you're supplementing the baby, the baby's getting the nutrition they need, and you get the added benefit of that nipple stimulation that helps to increase your milk supply. Mm -hmm. So that's a fantastic uh, resource. And, and really when we get into those things, those are things that you would want to work with an IBCLC on to, mm -hmm. to um, make sure, you know, that the baby is getting what they need, the baby is gaining and that that mom is doing okay too, that we're supporting her milk supply. But these are the new things. Have you seen these? Because I haven't seen that. <laughs> came out probably in the last not even two years. So this is actually a Hakka brand silicone pump. And there are other brands that you can find on Amazon. I actually buy them in bulk and bring them with me. And if I feel like a mom can benefit from them when I do a consult, I'll give it to her. And I know you have two of the photos. One I, I gave you that's um, how to actually put it on the breast because you want to invert the flange like this. So do you have the other one with the four pictures? Yeah. Oh, the one with the four pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So that just shows like how to put it on and you put okay. it on against the breast and you burp it. So I even have my, so you fl you invert it, put it against the breast, burp it, and then flatten it out and it will stay attached to the breast with suction. And so this is what I call the cheater method. It's like free milk. So you can actually breastfeed the baby on one side and then put the silicone pump on the other and it catches the letdown. Okay, I have heard of that. Yes. Um, and so, so this, so here's, oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> it's okay. So you had given me a picture that I think that is this in action. Yes. So this so is, so there you go. She was at my mom's group. So she's kind of sitting straight up. Her baby's a little older. So positioning, um, she's got it down. So she knows what position she can feed the baby in, but she, volunteered to take that photo for me so that I would have it. And that just shows that silicone pump in action. So. And that's, when, that's fantastic. Uh -huh. I mean, for me, I had, I had a baby where that, where that silicone pump is, <laughs> but with, you know, with, with Daniel, with my single, I didn't have that. And that's, um, I've also seen other things that, um, that are much smaller than that, maybe for a, um, for a smaller letdown that just seem kind of, uh, the, like they fit inside the bra. Oh, the milkies, the milk saver. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So moms will use those, those can be nice. Um, I'll tell you that for me, whenever I had my kids, I mean, my youngest is 15. I did not know anything about flange sizes. So looking back now, I realized I was using the wrong size flange. So I just labeled myself as not a good pumper. Oh, unwell to the pump. So when I was on shift, I would pump, but I never pumped enough for to, you know, leave for a full shift for the baby. So on my days off, this is the pump. This isn't the exact same one, but the same brand. This is just an Avent handheld mm -hmm. and Medela has them as well. And so what I would do is I'd feed the baby on one side. See, I have my, my doll here. My turn needs to go up a little more. And then I would hold this hand pump and I would pump on the other to get a half an ounce here, a half an ounce there, and and just be able to um, add to my pump supply. So, so this is like the breastfeeding equivalent of rub your tummy and pat your head. Uh -huh. <laughs> but like you said, you, you know, you do whatever you need to do to yeah. get that supply and to have enough, you know, to feed the baby. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And we were talking earlier about, you know, actually for the, especially those moms that have to pump to supplement or that are exclusively pumping, there's everything from a hospital grade pump that you can rent from. So this is where I usually tell people in the East Valley, we have Modern Milk in Scottsdale and Modern Milk in Gilbert, and they rent pumps. 
they, they have both the Medela and the Amita hospital, right? And then Banner Del Webb on the west side is um, one of the only hospitals that still does um, pump rentals. And they will actually rent a pump for just $25 for one week. So if someone wants to just try it out, they can without committing to a, a whole month. And then they would just, um, you know, retro it if you wanted to rent it longer. So the hospital grade pumps are an option. It sounds like you went home with a hospital grade pump, which was totally. I did. And as you mentioned, a lot of times insurance covers this. So mm -hmm. if this is something you're looking into, touch base with your insurance to see if that's something that'll be covered and you don't have to worry about out-of-pocket expense. Yeah. And with a hospital grade rental, um, a lot of times you can get insurance to cover that rental by having the pediatrician or your OB or your midwife write a prescription saying that you need it because you have twins, because, you know, whatever, there's different codes that they can use. So that's what I would recommend. I call the hospital rentals the Cadillacs of pump. Not everyone needs one, but in those cases where pumping needs to start early on and, um, you know, you have two babies or you're exclusively pumping, it's definitely an amazing option. Some and people if the, need thought, to of, if the yeah. thought of renting a pump kind of weirds you out, everyone gets new tubes and like the, the part that you would be getting is not the part that's ever touched anybody's body. So I yeah. think that's important to know as well, because it can seem like something kind of, kind of weird, but it's really just the mechanics that you're renting and the, those tubes in the phalanges can be purchased uh, even at your local corner drugstore. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not, um, it's not gross at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is, that's a very good uh, thing to point out. They're closed systems. So um, yeah, you get your own kit. So the hospitals can send you home with one. Um, Modern Milk has them as well. So you can order them on, like you said, on Amazon, you can go to Target has like, has Medela. Um, but usually the actual like fittings that go to the pump, um, you want to make sure you get the right ones. So mm -hmm. at Modern Milk or at the hospitals or whomever you're renting it from, they should be able to help you with that. Okay. And Great. then you were kind of, you had asked me like what my favorite pumps were, what I like, because it always depends on again, like how often is this mom going to need to be pumping? Is she going back to work? Is it just something that she's going to do every once in a while? Some insurance companies still try to get away with just covering like a $20 electric pump. And those just are not going to be a good option for moms that are going back to work. Um, so you definitely want to get one that's going to be able to stand up to that kind of use. And the two most common ones right now are Medela and, um, Spectra. I used to be a Medela girl. It's what I used with my kids. It's what the hospital that I worked at, what they had available. And I was just familiar with it. It's been easy to get the parts for those for a long time, back when we had B Babies R Us, <laughs> so six months ago, um, you could get all the parts there. And uh, Ami or, sorry, Spectra came out a couple years ago, and I started having more and more moms choosing that option. And some of them, they had had children before and used the Medela. And really, most of the time, I would say 90 some percent of the time, the moms very much like the Spectra more than the Medela. So that seems to be like one of the more popular ones right now. So the Good Medela, there's a couple different models. There's the Medela Freestyle, the Medela Pumpin' Style, um, several different Medela ones. Some come in a backpack, some come with just in that little black container or a bag. I have one right here that's just the Medela that's in the bag. So it just looks like this. The Medela ones are great pumps. They're not a closed system. So these are definitely not pumps, this particular uh, line of them. And the Medela pumps are a little different than the Spectra because the Medela really just has the two functions. And that would be that letdown function. So I'm gonna turn this on, see if you can hear it. You can tell me. Does this sound familiar? Oh yeah. So here's the letdown function. It'll do this for two minutes. And so it mimics the baby, you know, when the babies do like those fast sucks mm -hmm. to get the milk to let down. So it'll do that for two minutes. And then you can switch it over 
or it'll switch over after two minutes. And then it goes back to um, what we call the expression. So massage or expression. So the massage is the first two minutes that goes really fast. And then the expression slows down. And that's, you know, when a baby is on the breast and they do that drinking, that's what you see. And then you can actually turn the vacuum up. So have you seen the Spectra pumps? No. So they have an S1, which is this one, and it's blue. And they have the S2, which is pink. And the difference is this one, you can charge and you just carry this around. So you don't have a cord. Ooh. And it's got a Starbucks drink holder in the back. <laughs> you see that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you need water. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that, but you need water. Okay. Water, water, water. <laughs> um, or you could put one bottle <laughs> back there. And um, so that's kind of fun. The other fun thing is that it has a light, which moms love this for the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. It also has the screen that keeps a timer on. Did you, do you remember pumping? And after a while, you're like, I have no idea if I just pump for 10 minutes or 20 or 30. Like, well, I always pumped one episode of Grey's Anatomy, so oh, it was okay. pretty consistent. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the opening song will cause a letdown even now. <laughs> so funny. I pumped back in the olden days and we didn't have DVRs. So I didn't have that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but this actually has a timer on it. So a lot of moms like that. And this one is customizable because it actually, you can customize the cycle and the vacuum. Unlike that Medela pump that just has the two cycles and then right. the so yeah, this, so when you turn it on, it goes to that uh, massage mode that's faster. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit. So maybe, can you hear it? Yeah. Okay. So it's faster. And then you push this button, it goes to expression, it slows down. Can you hear that? It sounds like a small animal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll turn up the vacuum so you can hear it a little more. But the customizable part is not only the vacuum, but the cycle. It goes all the way from 54 cycles per minute down to 38 cycles per minute. So there's okay. six different levels. And, and that, again, like um, 38 is better if you have a premature baby and you're trying to just bring your milk in. And then you can increase the cycles depending on different circumstances. And this is so, why yeah. it's really important to touch base with an IBCLC because uh, you need to know which one's right for you and maybe even be fitted for the right pieces and all that. So it's really good to touch base with someone who, who knows this stuff and someone who is IBCLC is going to have that knowledge. Okay. And anyone can, and can call me or just send me a message through my business Facebook if they just have a couple questions about which pump and that kind of thing. Um, I definitely don't do not mind an, ad, like answering any questions about the, that kind of thing, for sure. Okay, great. So. I'll provide that link as well on the on the broadcast. Okay. Then. okay. Um, so we were also talking about um, expectations for amounts, and so there, as far as okay. as from my perspective, there are two different ways to look at it: um, how old the baby is, and mm -hmm. how much they're breastfeeding, and then. And then also uh, the the efficiency of the pump. Yes. And maybe you have more ways to look at it as well. Yeah. Well, we tend to see those photos on social media of the mom that has that freezer full with hundreds and hundreds of bags of breast milk. And we can compare ourselves to that. And that can be really, really overwhelming. Um, nobody ever posts the picture of their freezer with four bags of frozen breast milk in there, which is a totally great amount. Like we really only need enough milk stored for the next baby's feeding session or enough milk stored for that day that you're at work. Because then when you're at work, you're going to be pumping to provide milk for that next day. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely don't need a huge, huge storage. And when we have, uh, you know, one or two or three day old baby, mom is going to be getting colostrum, which is just a teaspoonful at a time. 
it does come out better with that hand expression. That's why I teach that. That little bit of breast milk can get lost in this big old pump piece. You know, by the time it gets down, it drips into the bottle or the, the bag and you're trying to like get that little bit out of there. Um, sometimes that can be difficult. And then once a, a woman's milk comes in somewhere, textbook definition is between day three to day five. And then, you know, she may be getting about a half an ounce to a third of an ounce. So about 15 to 20 mLs per feed. So that's not unusual. And then it slowly increases till closer to a week. Mom is getting about an ounce an hour. So if she's pumping every two hours, she should be getting about two ounces. That's considered a full supply for one baby. And then once we get closer to three to four weeks, mom, so, so up until about three weeks, mom is making about 24 ounces in 24 hours per baby. And then, um, and sometimes it can take a while to get there. And so I don't think mom should be discouraged. Like sometimes some women, their milk comes in on day five and they have copious amounts of it and their, her milk is in and there you go. And other moms, it just takes a while, especially depending on, you know, what kind of birth she had and, um, you know, is she sleeping? Is she eating? Or, you know, she's doing everything perfect and her milk is just taking a little longer to come in and that and there are also medical reasons if someone has mm -hmm. if someone has diabetes their um their milk is more likely to come in just a little bit later it's still healthy it's still fine um but there are medical factors as well things that have to do with your medical status and your history that'll impact mm -hmm. when your milk comes in but it's still normal and expected and healthy absolutely absolutely and so then once the baby gets closer to about four weeks old, from about four weeks until six months, um, mom is making about 28 to 35 ounces per 24 hour period for each baby. So yeah, so that would be considered a full supply. And what a mom can pump is not necessarily exactly what the baby is transferring. It can go either way, but um, a lot of times baby can actually transfer milk. Mom is a lot more relaxed when the baby is on her breast after a certain point than her holding the pump there and pumping. So that's mm. always something to keep in mind. So, I yeah. think that's a really important point because sometimes we're very, um, we're very into numbers mm -hmm. and there are no tick marks on your breasts. So when you're breastfeeding, you don't know how much the baby's getting, but you know from certain signs that the baby's full, the baby's growing. And once you start pumping or you're using formula, you have the tick marks on those bottles and that can bring in some level of paranoia for what, what is mm -hmm. the baby getting. And if, I, I know some people will pump in order to see how much they're getting, but it's not a good indication because sometimes you'll get around 60% in the pump as compared to what you'd get from the breast. So the best idea is when you contact your IBCLC, you can do a weight before and after mm -hmm. feeding, and that's going to give you an idea of what the baby's actually getting. The pump is not necessarily going to give you that information. No, that that is very, very true. And, and I completely agree with what you're saying about like really wanting to have the numbers because you're a registered dietitian, I'm a registered nurse, we are all about the numbers in a lot of ways. Um, you know, in the hospital, we measure everything. We measure everything a patient is drinking, every um, amount. Ins and outs. <laughs> yeah, the input and output. And um, when I went home with my first baby almost 20 years ago, I had to really have some conversations with myself in my head because she was supplemented. She was jaundiced. She was in the nursery for a full week and she wasn't a little bit jaundiced. She was um, actually very dangerously jaundiced and they almost transferred her to Phoenix Children's. So she was supplemented. I was pumping, putting her to the breast some. And when we got the okay to just breastfeed, I'm, I was like, but how will I know that she's getting enough? And you know, that's when we have to step back and look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And so we look at, you know, do we hear swallowing when the baby's on the breast? Do our breasts feel softer after a feed? And, you know, we look at diapers. Diapers are great. They tell a story. And then, you know, weight gain, however often you're able to weigh your baby, whether it's just at the checkups at the pediatrician office or you buy uh, 
an infant scale on Amazon or you rent a hospital grade scale, which is a possibility. And I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're working with someone because you want someone that can yeah. walk you through those numbers. I totally, I need to second that. Um, it's it's not valuable information for the mother to have a multi times a day weight of the child. It's If you feel the need to weigh your child constantly and you get very nervous, it's a conversation to have with your pediatrician, um, your IBCLC, or even your primary care physician because it may be an indication of postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done some segments on that as well. But yeah, having a scale at home, only do that if that's been recommended to you by whoever is helping you with that. Yeah, yes. You know, they've done some really cool studies and um, they've done a couple actually where they have women pump and they have them uh, start to cover up. So they, they track like their pumping outputs and then they have women cover and not look at how much they're getting. And they actually found that women got more when they weren't focusing. Like, do, I remember doing wow. it, like, putting my head down and I'm watching like every drop that came out of my pump, like, ah. And so um, they've actually found that when we're not so focused on that, the milk will flow better. And Great, yeah, because so, of the anxiety, because yeah. anxiety, high anxiety will adversely affect not only your pumping, but your total supply. Yes. And it's, so I always like think, you know, I'm telling moms like, stop stressing, you'll get more milk. And they're like, I can't stop stressing. I can't stop stressing. I'm, you know, and, and so that you know, that can happen. And I totally understand that. And so if that's you and, and you're like, okay, I'm trying to relax, but I have so much anxiety about this. Like, please, please reach out for help because, um, like you said, that can be a sign of some postpartum anxiety and, um, you know, just having somebody as a sounding board to be able to ask questions and to walk through what's going on can make a huge, huge difference. So, Pumping, right. like we said this in the beginning, I'll say it again, pumping is a lot of work. And, um, you know, when you're having to pump that often, you're trying to figure out like, okay, if we're going to go out for the day, where am I going to be able to go plug my pump in or where can I pump privately? Because it's harder, like being able to feed the baby at the breast, you can be a little more modest and cover up. Um, but when you're pumping, that can be a little bit harder. So I did not consider that. That's really, that's really a big concern. Yes. So, you know, having somebody that you can ask and sometimes, you know, you may not need the help one-on-one -on -one of an IBCLC, but just to be able to ask those questions. And there are free postpartum support groups and breastfeeding support groups across the Valley. And, um, you know, there's almost one every single day of the week. Now, granted, one of them might be in Tuesday, you know, on Tuesday in Goodyear, and the other one's Friday in Scottsdale. And then I'm not sure. I think Modern Milk and Gilbert has their happy boob group on Fridays too. So um, what a great Mercy, name. <laughs> uh, Scottsdale Shea has one. Mercy Gilbert has one. Some of the birth centers do. And um, that can be a really great place to just get out of the house. But you're not going into real public. It's like fake public because it's just around other moms. Mm -hmm. And some of those groups. They will have a scale there and some of them are run by IBCLCs, but um, even if it's just peer support, that's super valuable. So that's yeah. something that I always want to make sure that a mom is hooked up with if her breastfeeding journey includes pumping or um, she's exclusively, if her breastfeeding journey is that she's exclusively pumping because, you know, that mom is still breastfeeding. She's still feeding her baby from the breast, whether it's, you know, one bottle a day, or it's all of the milk that baby is consuming. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And so we touched on, we touched on how stress can really impact your milk supply. And honestly, um, when I mentioned that we were supplementing the twins one bottle a day, sometimes it was every, all of their nutrition for the day because, uh, well, not to get into specifics, but we had family in town. Mm -hmm. And I just, stress can really affect you. So let's talk about some other things that can help a milk supply. Uh, a lot of times I get asked that, especially by the pumping moms who are concerned and want to pump more. Um, and the first thing is hydration. Mm -hmm. And there are all these numbers, and we talked about how we're big on numbers. And the truth is that, that hydration needs 
really do vary person to person. The textbook, as far as, as I've read, is 13 cups a day for someone who's breastfeeding one baby. But what you really want to do is look at your urine color. Yes, that's to what people do. <laughs> yeah, because people are very stuck on the numbers and you, you you have your your gallon with those tick marks, you know, times of day and all that. And whether you're breastfeeding or whether you're like a man going on a hike, like whoever you are, you judge your hydration by your urine color, not by anything else. You're going yeah. for that pale, the pale yellow color that you can see through. And if it's darker than that, you need to drink more water. It's going to be different for different people, depending on activity level and moisture in the air and temperature mm -hmm. and season and genetics. And so, and so there's throwing around these numbers is really, um, it's really pointless and it just adds to stress. So instead of looking at amounts, just check your urine easy enough. Mm -hmm. That's so what awesome. else? exactly what I tell people. It's what I've told people for years when I'd see moms in triage, you know, and they would leave a urine sample and I would come out with this like orange juice looking and I'm like, somebody needs to drink more water. Um, but yes, yeah. I, I Look in the toilet and your urine should look like a pale lemonade, not like orange juice. Yeah, oh, orange juice. Yeah, yeah. and the, the thing is there, is, there is a such thing as too much water. There is, and people mm -hmm. don't know that. I recently saw, very recently, I saw advice for a breastfeeding mom who wanted to increase her supply and someone said, drink until you feel like you're going to drown. No, because you could really damage yourself. And and we have to be careful where we give advice because you're giving advice to someone who's exhausted and stressed out and just trying to do the best they can. We don't need to put stumbling blocks in front of mm -hmm. people who are trying to just feed their babies. And so there is a concern. You can have too little water. You can have too much water. So just check your urine color. But as far as other things. Hmm? If, I, if I have a mom that is just really, really overwhelmed and wants a really structured plan, I will um, have them get out like like 32 ounce hydro flasks or 32 ounce water bottles. And cause it's typically close to a hundred milliliters or not, a, not milliliters, sorry, a hundred ounces a day. Um, and so sometimes I will just have them pull out, you know, whatever water bottles they have and put water in it and put it out on the kitchen island so that they mm -hmm. know throughout the day they're gonna, you know, sometimes they need just to have that there. And by the end of the day, they need to have emptied those. I will have moms um, try like some coconut water if they like it for the electrolytes or go to sprouts and get some electrolyte water, because like you're saying, you can drink too much water and it can flush out your electrolytes, your potassium mm -hmm. and magnesium. And um, so I'll, I'll do that. So I always ask moms, how's your appetite? Because a lot of times it's really good for a day or two right after the baby is born and they get home and their appetite just isn't as good because they're tired and they're stressed. And um, and then also they're sitting and feeding the baby or pumping and the snacks are in the kitchen. And so I always ask about a snack basket and um, what kinds of things they like to snack on because that's important. Right. I'm a big advocate of snack stations. Visual yes. cues, you have diaper stations in your house, have snack stations as well. And snacks you can eat one-handed. So while you're feeding the baby, you can, you can eat as yeah. well. Because you can, you know, eat all the lactation cookies in the world. And it's not going to help if um, you're not stimulating the breasts often. So, okay, so we are going to kind of talk about numbers because sometimes that's just how we have to talk about things. There are numbers that are valid, yeah. So with a with a newborn, we really want either um, breastfeeding or pumping to happen within the first six hours after birth, if possible. If for some reason the baby can't go to the breast or the mom knows she wants to just exclusively pump, that needs to start um, within the first six hours after birth. And then, or as soon as possible when mom is able to. And then um, to establish a milk supply, we want uh, breast stimulation to happen about 10 to 12 times in 24 hours. So that can be some what they call power pumping or like frequent pumping, like once an hour for a couple of hours in a row so that you can get those three or four hour sleep stretches in there in the very beginning because that sleep is super important, super important. Yeah. And then, so I'm just going to kind of talk about this specifically for pumping, since that's what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
um, once the milk is in and the supply is established, everybody's like uh, magic number is a little different, but it typically is between eight to 10 times in a 24 hour period and not going longer than about four to six hours, a four to six hour stretch usually at night. And some moms can go six hours and have a full milk supply and some moms need to stay closer to four hours. So those are the numbers when we talk about, you know, pumping and um, breast stimulation and nothing is gonna replace that. So the next is hydration and nutrition. I always tell moms, I don't care like how much you're eating. You don't need to eat a huge meal. If you're just putting 10 almonds in your mouth and munching on those, that's a snack. That's okay. As long as you're, if you're eating a bite of a granola bar and then a couple hours later you eat another bite, that that's something like it doesn't have to be a full sandwich every time you're eating. So I don't know. What do you think about that for snacks? Like if a mom were to ask you. What for to snacks, I think. I, I'm big on intuitive eating. I'm big on listening to the body. And your your body is going to increase your hunger and thirst signals as your need for doesn't? more. What's what that? If it doesn't? What, what if oh, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Um, okay. So that the hurdle with that when you're a new mom is that when you ignore those signals, they start to become quieter and quieter. The volume just goes down on those signals when you ignore them. And as new moms, we often ignore those because, oh, I'll just wait five minutes. Oh, I'll just, I'll just do this. I'll just do that. Okay, right after I feed the baby. And before you know it, the whole day has gone by and your signals start to get quieter and quieter as you don't listen to them. So yeah, you should, you should have snacks here and there whenever. The idea with the visual cues, with the snack baskets, with the snack stations and the water out is to have that visual cue and that visual cue is going to make your biological signal louder. When you see a delicious muffin out, mm -hmm. you're going to say, oh right, I haven't eaten and you're going to be hungry. So I think it's important to have things that are ready. So with your snack stations, you're gonna have things that are shelf stable. You know, you're not gonna have like a block of cheese in your snack mm -hmm. station that's out, but you do wanna have your fridge organized so that when you open it, you immediately see things you can Oh, you can you can just shove in your mouth right away. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to serve as a visual cue as well. And when you have when you have those visual cues, when you have food prepped, and by the way, when people come over and ask how they can help, ask them to help you prep food. Uh, yes. that, that's that's going to help to maintain your nutrition through this time. When you're pregnant, you need about 300 extra calories per day to maintain a healthy pregnancy. But when you're breastfeeding, you need about 500. And not that the numbers actually matter, I'm just bringing them up in order to illustrate the point that breastfeeding actually requires more nutrition than a pregnancy. So it's important to have those cues out there. But yeah, a, a bite of granola bar is better than nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And having granola bars out, those are shelf stable. You can have them out. You can have them where you can see them. You know, put them in front of the TV. Put them next to the diaper station. It's it, you, you start to, uh, it may sound not appetizing, but at some point, it, that all just goes out the window. It doesn't matter. Have it where you're going to see it. Have it where you're going to remember to eat it. Yes. And that's, that's valuable. Yes, definitely. And, you know, those are, those are really good things that, um, you know, being really intentional about that um, is, is really important because it is all about self-care. We have to take care of mom. We have to feed the mom so she can feed the baby. Exactly. Yeah. So, and you mentioned lactation cookies. Those are important too. And I just want to circle back to the point with the electrolyte drinks. You have to be careful with some of those because, okay, smart water, for example, says it contains electrolytes, but if you look carefully, it's electrolytes for taste. It's not a meaningful source of electrolytes. So if you find that you're dehydrated and you need something that has electrolytes, you want something that's more substantial than that. Um, coconut water is great. I personally like the taste. You can get some flavored stuff that's got, you know, a hint of pineapple in it, which happens to be my favorite. I like that um, too. Yeah. But um, so that the thing with coconut water is that it's low in sodium. So sodium is a is an electrolyte. And while we're constantly hearing in the news, you should decrease your sodium, decrease your sodium. When you're trying to hydrate and you're coming from a dehydrated state, you do want some sodium. And so, um, so you want to make up for that sodium. If you're drinking coconut water to rehydrate, you want to have that sodium as well. Okay. So just something to keep in mind. But um, coconut water is amazingly high in potassium and other electrolytes that are going to bring you back to a state of adequate hydration for pumping or breastfeeding. Nice. Love it. 
Yeah. What so else did we have? I put out um, the pumps and then one of the other things that I find very often is that moms are using the wrong size flange. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I have the pumping consult um, available and you can find all this information online for sure. But I have all the different flange sizes for pretty much all the, all the different pumps. And so um, that's part of what I do. So this one even has the kindy bag on it. So mom can mm -hmm. pump right into a breast milk storage bag instead of into a bottle and then putting it in a breast milk storage bag so there's the different flange sizes there's the different kinds of flanges like this is actually a pump and pals and some moms actually do better with these than the medella flanges or the spectra so this is in a spectra bottle actually mm -hmm. and um, you'll hear like especially if you get so i'm really the exclusive pumping moms you know, with all of the Facebook groups for um, exclusively pumping, those moms know the hacks. Like they know how to hack the pump so you can use the Spectra parts with the Medela pump or the Medela parts with the Spectra pump and um, the Free Me pumps and, and all of those. So there's a lot of different options. And I think that can kind of get overwhelming. So what I really just want moms to know is that using the correct flange size is really important. If you go on the Amita website they actually have a, a tool basically that you can print out that you can use it's like calipers kind of that you can use to measure your nipple because flange sizes really only we really need to take into consideration the nipple size not the areola so just the size of the nipple not the areola and certainly not the cup size of the breast because really only the the nipple should be moving into the neck of the flange. So we don't want a lot of the areola being pulled. Mm -hmm. So often I find that moms are using the wrong size flange and that can affect their milk supply. So sometimes we just switch that. That's all we, we do and mom's supply will increase. Wow. It yeah. makes sense. It, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So here are your takeaways, snack stations, hydration stations, touch base with an IVCLC in order to make sure you're using the appropriate mechanics in the appropriate way with the appropriate size flanges and, yeah. and get support, make sure you have support. So I think this is really valuable. Amy, do you have anything else to add before we well, take off? And the mom is pumping. And again, sometimes, you know, moms want to exclusively pump because that works better for them. But sometimes we have moms that are exclusively pumping because the baby wasn't latching well in the beginning. And then they just think that that's their only option for the rest of, you know, the time that the baby is taking a bottle. And um, I've had babies that we've been able to transition back to the breast at two, three, four, even five months old. So, um, if a mom's like, I just want to try, like, just try some, I've had moms do it completely on their own. And then I've had some moms that have, you know, definitely needed to work with an IBCLC for that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Like, even if you find that you're two, three months into it and you're exclusively pumping and you're like, I wish I could just get rid of the middleman and just put the baby, the pump being the middleman and just put the baby to the breast. It, it can be possible. So reach out for help if that's something that you're interested in. But again, however the baby is getting breast milk and however much breast milk that baby is getting, you know, that's, that's huge. And I think that moms really need to give themselves a lot of credit for that. I think that's a very good point. And next week I'm going to cover, since we've done breastfeeding, we've done pumping. Next week I'm going to cover how to choose a formula if you are formula feeding. Mm -hmm. So that'll that's be next week. You don't want to miss one. it. There's so many options. So that's I know really good. it can be overwhelming. And when you have a child who who's fussy, colicky, not seeming to to tolerate their feeding, um, sometimes you need to work with it a little bit. And so we're going to talk about that next week. So join me, Nap Time Nutrition, um, Tuesday at 1 p.m. Arizona time, which I believe is still 4 p.m. East Coast time and 1 p.m. West Coast time. But you people are all changing your clocks soon. And well, we don't do that here. So it gets a little confusing, uh, but that's coming up. So join me next week. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining me on this broadcast. It's such valuable information. Thank you. I, I so appreciate that you asked me. Yeah, well, 
see you next time. And you can find Amy's information in the comments section. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.